So, hello everybody. This evening I'm um, filling in for uh, Carmelo Piri, who can't be with us this evening. Um, my name is Julianne Day, and I'm really thrilled to be able to present Dr. Anna Davenport this evening. Uh, Anna is a medical doctor from Canada who practiced family medicine from 1989 to just recently when she set up her own private clinic just outside of Toronto. Anna has additional expertise in sports medicine, and she also has a passion for sport herself, being a master's rower, Nordic skier, downhill skier, and a triathlete. In fact, Anna has completed three Ironman, or should we say Iron Person, competitions. She blends her skills in the study of optimal movement patterns to treat athletes with medical issues, as well as athletes with injuries. Finding that evaluating mechanisms of injury through the observation of non-optimal movement patterns informs effective treatment approaches. In training as a level three fascial manipulation teacher, Anna will be talking today about the level three treatment approach as applied to different cases, including concussion. So Anna, I'll hand it over to you and uh, will you get your slide up? You want to click on your slide presentation? Uh, there yeah, you go. great. That's good. Okay, guys, thank you for joining me on a Wednesday afternoon coming from Canada where I'm still looking at lots of snow out the window. So as Julie said, uh, I'm talking about fascial manipulation and internal dysfunction and the treatment of concussion, which is something that I see a fair bit of. And I, can I just interrupt you there? I just need to remind people that they can actually um, pose questions to you by writing in the section on the right hand side. Okay. And uh, at the end of this uh, presentation, then Anna will be able to answer some of your questions. Okay, thanks for that. Sorry. So, um, as, as Julie said, um, I uh, have, am a family doctor in Canada, but I thought I'd say a little bit more in case there's people in the audience that are saying, well, what is a doctor uh, doing in an area that's got a lot to do with the musculoskeletal system. So let me give you the background of, of why I'm so passionate about fascia manipulation and internal dysfunction. So uh, I've been practicing as a family doctor in Canada for th about 30 years and along the way took my specialization in sport medicine. Uh, as you heard, I'm a bit of an endurance junkie as far as athleticism. And so I followed my passion in sport, but somewhere in there, I hurt my knee. And I didn't really get better from my knee injury. And I was the best patient you could ever want with great connections to physiotherapy and all kinds of things. But it just didn't really work. And I think as uh, fashion manipulation providers, we've heard that story many times. So that started my investigation as to why. And I ended up at the World Fascia Conference in 2015, and I went from there. So what really excited me, though, was um, fascia manipulation for internal dys uh, dysfunction. So as a doctor for 35 years, I, my main area of work was in family medicine, where I would see my regular practice of over 2,000 patients. And I did the sport medicine on the side because of my sport love. But it was this introduction to family manipulation or fascia manipulation for internal dysfunction that made me reevaluate the way that I actually practice medicine. A lot of family medicine is about complaints that aren't life threatening. So Many complaints are those that are not diseases, but symptoms that really change the patient's quality of life. Headache, irritable bowel, food intolerance, vertigo, urinary incontinence, heartburn, carpal tunnel, and that's just a few of them. And believe me, I have prescribed many, many medications over my years to try and help these problems, not to say they don't work, but they don't compare to what I can do with FMID. So here I am. So 
The basic uh, learning that I take from this is without the lens of connection, it really disrupts how we look at the story or we look at the patient. We are our stories. There's many injuries and scars that are hidden and a compensation often follows. And as you all know, these scars can remain quiet, but unknowingly have an impact somewhere else in the body. So we have to hear all the patient's story in order to hear them. And I believe this strongly as many of you do, but our limiting time as, as providers is often uh, time. Our limiting factor is often time. So sometimes when working with these people, if I was to give advice, it's allow the time. And if you allow the time initially, it works and you get finished actually faster. So always go to the beginning. So we're going to go to the beginning as far as reviewing what uh, we know about uh, internal fascia. So we call it, or the, the stecos have called it the inner fascia, and it's made up of investing fascia and insertional fascia. So there's a lot of eyes to sort of get in your head, but once you can understand investing fascia and insertional fascia, which is all inner fascia, it makes it a lot easier than um, the fascia or how it was described before, because before the different areas of fascia, depending where they were in the body, were uh, often had famous anatomist names, and you didn't necessarily get that connection that is important to understand how fascia manipulation with internal dysfunction works. So the top one, investing fascia, or called visceral fascia, when it's around the organs, it's uh, very adherent to the organs, and it has a real role in the, co uh, the coordination of the organ. And it, it holds on to it tight. It almost holds the organ together in a shape. Insertional fascia, or parietal fascia, as it's called in the abdomen, is uh, can be partially separated, and its real uh, job is to be to work synergistically with other organs. In some cases, it might be attached to the epimedial fascia on the trunk, such in the lungs or the kidneys, and uh, or separated by loose connective tissue. So here we have examples of the two types of fascia. You can see the one on the left is the, insert, is the investing fascia. It's almost stuck to the organ. It's very thin and you can't really separate it off easily compared to the one on the right, which is insertional fascia. And it's much stronger because it needs to be and it connects all the organs together. Here we have another uh, example of the investing fascia in the bowel. So you can see how it's very adherent into the intestine. In this way, it actually stretches every time the food goes through there. And um, it's thought that this visceral peritoneum plays a role in the coordination of the uh, peristalsis. It, um, if you think about it, it gets stretched out. And when it gets stretched out, the fascia, then there's a network of nerves that get stretch, stretched. So it propagates the signal down. And uh, then we can understand how the peristalsis could work. If there was surgery in this area on an organ part, uh, certainly this area would be somewhat affected. So here we have, in this one, we have the insertional fascia, and this is obviously on the lung, and um, it's attached to the musculoskeletal system. So you can see it's, it has to be stronger. Um, the other ones, such as the kidneys uh, and the lungs, would both depend on the musculoskeletal uh, system to operate. If you take a deep breath or you sing, all those things um, mean that you need a connection to the outside. The hollow organs uh, have their own smooth muscles, so work is a little bit differently. That would be the pharynx, the stomach, intestines, the heart, the bladder, um, where the smooth muscles attach more to the investing fascia. 
So in this sense, you can see how this would be because the fascia is attached to the outside on the musculoskeletal system, it gives you a sense on what you might be treating uh, when you do uh, uh, when you do do a release of a densification in an area on the musculoskeletal system, it could in turn be pulling onto an organ. So again, the insertional fascia is also super important because it has it anchors the organs. Imagine if we didn't have any attachments to the outside, you know, the organs would just sit in the, at the bottom of the pelvis, um, not attached. So obviously they have to, they maintain the organs in the correct position, but they, it, they have to be held in a way that you don't affect the motility of the organs. If it's anchored too tight, then that could, um, you know, mess things up. And that's certainly some of the symptoms we see. Uh, as far as that goes. Also, it when you move and bend, something has to keep the organs in the right place. You'll, you know, with the balance of the elasticity is lost um, in the insertional fascia, it can certainly disrupt the interrelational fascia in the abdominal canister. So if one organ is disrupted, then it talks to the next organ so you can get a cascade of events with that. So in this uh, particular picture, that's the falciform ligament, uh, which is attached to the liver. So I'm not going to go into all of the uh, organs, but this is just to show also in the vascular system, you see a, there's a vascular sheath and you can see from um, where the investing fascia, which would be more into the vessel, and then you would see the insertional fascia, which is outside. So the, you would have to have a protective mechanism like that uh, to protect the, uh, the, the vessels as they go through the, uh, often through the musculoskeletal system. If you didn't have that, they would be compressed. And when you contract a muscle, then, then the blood flow would change, would uh, cease. You also have to have that envelope in the carotid, in the jugular veins, and the vagus nerves. So the fascia, the vascular sheath, is the uh, insertional fascia which attaches to the musculoskeletal system. And as mentioned it, uh, above, it's it's also around the nerves and it just allows it all to move more smoothly. You'll also note from that diagram, you can imagine that between the insertional fascia and the investing fascia, there's this vital space, this space that has to occur for that sliding to occur. So in the case of the insertional and the investing fascia though, they have to talk to each other at some point. They have to be connected around the organs. So this is an example, example of the, um, the, in the abdomen that the inner organs, visceras are connected to the abdominal wall at the mesentery. And um, the mesentery is the point where the vessels and the nerves uh, enter uh, in as well. Again, thinking of that vital space that you need between the two types of fascia so that they can work on their own, but there also has to be work in harmony with the other surrounding organs. So way back in embryology, I remember in med school, there was this uh, discussion of how the organ, how things sunk into a balloon and it took me, what, 30 years later, or 25 years later for me to understand that model of the balloon in embryology class, what the importance was later on in life. So what, do we, what happens? What happens if this stuff is not balanced? Well, if we think just about the uh, GI system, lots of issues. Uh, it's what I saw in family practice so commonly. So you have digestive problems, you have reflux, you have constipation, you have swallowings, irritable bowel. That's just a few that you mentioned, uh, that, that I could mention that would occur um, on a regular basis. 
And these problems are also so common in the patients we see, but they usually are not presenting with these complaints. They're coming in with something else. And, uh, but if you ask, you'll often find uh, these hidden in the background. So next we've got SpongeBob. Love this guy because he, he's a good visual for me. When you're trying to understand what's happening um, with the next area called the tensile structure. So if you're managing a canister uh, and it's got to be stiffer on one side so um, things can be anchored to or that we can stand up. But it has to be expandable on the other side uh, so the abdomen can extend when we eat and we, uh, the lungs can expand when we breathe. And then those arms and legs also have to move around and they can't affect what goes on in the abdomen and the chest. So they have to be able to pull. So tension must be equal. Uh, so uh, none of the organs are inside will be affected. So you guys who have done level three have seen this picture before. So this is SpongeBob standing up and we taught and the picture in the bottom uh, there of the chain is called a catenary. So a catenary is a plain curve whose shapes correspond to the hanging homogeneous flexible chain on either end. So if those posts holding up the chain uh, are falling over, well, that's going to affect the chain in the middle, which is uh, where we, we say our organs are. So we talk about um, the catenaries of the trunk in which you could have uh, they're all involved. They're all there to help us stand, move, eat, drink. But um, often in FMID, one of them is affected. So the first one being the AP tensor, it, there would be two in the front, both going on each side of the linea albia. And then there would be two in the back, both going along the spine. The spine. And the lateral lateral would be on um, both sides of rectus abdominis and then would be uh, along the erector spines in the back as well. And so there would be four in total. And then the obliques go from the intercostals um, uh, and from the oblique muscles. So you can see that, that diagram there. When you would look at the body, you can actually see these lines. They more along the lines of muscle fusion. I like this picture. I think it's a good model of what we're trying to um, work with. So as we said, if things are gonna stay quiet in the trunk, then the tension um, from the arms and the legs has to be equal. So the, 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 the distal tensors and the pivot joints, which are in the deep fascia, really have to be equal, or you can imagine you start to to pull up, um, you pull on the abdomen or the chest wall. The pivot points, which are the ones closest to the abdomen, they also have to move. They can't, uh, they have to, they're, that's why they're in the humerus and in the hip, because in all directions, that has to be a equal pull. Another model, breaking it down into tensile structures. Um, and you put them all together and we get this thing called the catenary. So the tensile structure would be uh, in the trunk, would be the pelvi, the lumbi, and the thorax. Uh, and we talk slightly differently about the head and the neck it's a different canister. So uh, the neck and the head work slightly differently. They can, um, they can work independently as tensile structure or the, the column can work as a proximal tensor to the head. So same concept, the pressure tension has to be neutral in the head and neck for things to work. 
So that brings us to talking briefly, reminding us about what happens in the head. So um, the cephalic tensor structure anatomy is a balanced tension between the neurocranium, which is in the back, and the splanchnocranium, which is in the face region. So there's a, um, the organ fashion units um, are all connected. So the organ fashion units uh, would be related to the nasal ca cavity. So that would be smell and taste. They would be the auditory, which would be hearing and would be statokinetic and the orbital cav cavities, which is sight and stereopsis, which is using both of them together. So APR, ACR, AMR, which is like the apparatuses in the trunk of visceral, vascular, and glandular. So, the, but the lines of tension, there's some, they're slightly different um, in how you, things are balanced versus the front and the back of the trunk. Balance, balance, balance. Sometimes I think that's what FM is all about, is getting the right tension. So again, this is a great picture from Carla's Atlas, and it shows how the tensions need to balance. So if we think of the gallia capitis on top, which really is superficial fascia, um, it's a, but it's a great big tendon and it's connected on all sides. It um, is sometimes confused with deep fascia, I think, because it's, it's quite compact. And it continues with the, uh, the, the muscles in the face and which then envelope down into the platysma muscle. And anteriorly, you get the uh, SMAS in the front and uh, posterior, the superficial fascia of, then you get the gallia capitis, and uh, then it goes through to the small muscles of the face, which must be all in synchrony. It's the organ fashion units there. And then the tension in the back and the neck, um, which goes down into the deep fascia of the neck, into the nuchal ligament, so it's attached uh, in that whole area. So a different way of looking at the, uh, the tension in the head and neck. So here we go again, looking posteriorly more at the nuchal ligament. It uh, in the back connects to the deep muscles of the neck, which are very high in proprioception and in the muscle spindles which then attaches to the superficial fascia of the neck, which connects to the, the gallia capitis, which sort of is the tension for all of us, and then onto the eyes and the ears. So you can see how tight muscles can cause vertigo is, um, in the front as, as it can affect a lot of the proprioception that we have there. So the auricularis muscle, that's the one above the ears. And you know, these doggies, they look so good when the, their ears are up, they're perk, they're listening, and not so much when there's a really loud noise or they're sad, they pull them down. There's a lot of thought that we don't have a lot of purpose for their auricularis muscle anymore. But I think if we look at FM, we can see why that muscle is stayed there. And going forward, you know, when I look at the dog on the right and his ears are pulled down, uh, well, he may be in trouble, but he's trying to protect his ears from the loud noise of you yelling at them. You know, I think that there may be a role somehow still in our ears, you know, as we go forward, we'll talk about concussion, but people with concussion can't stand loud noises. So could it be that that, that muscle is, is not functioning great to uh, try and muffle or dampen loud noise. So here's my schemic diagram of the trampoline on the head of the gallia capitis, trying to control everything in all directions uh, to th keep things quiet. So just a brief review um, of the, the tension in the neck. You know, that's 
such a fascinating area when I think about it because that space is so small and it's got so many vital organs in it. It's got um, carotids, uh, the vascular system, thyroids, parathyroids, the pharynx, the, lang the larynx, and the diameter of the neck is small. So trauma to that area, you can, you can see that um, lots of things could be affected. If swallowing itself is a uh, voluntary fascia a lot of the time, the, the pharynx gob, uh, pharyngobacillar fascia, which then, if you think about it, signals the epiglottis and pharynx to close the larynx, and then the food goes through. Uh, you know, the fascia is so important there for, for uh, things to uh, pass through the neck and important to life and well-being. So we're skipping along to where this talk is, what I'm interested in, in explaining about this talk. So it really is about the receptor sequence. And uh, it's to keep the apparatuses of the head in perfect tension um, so they all work in the ideal connection. So again, that would be the photoreceptors, the mechanoreceptors, and the chemoreceptors. Just like in the uh, trunk, we try hard to keep everything in perfect order. So we do in the head. And a lot of this, um, we think about the control catenaries like we did when we examined the uh, trunk to, to look for issues. But the neck in this case can also be a pivot point. It may be what is the movable part that holds the tension in the head correctly. So, and then we have the hands and the feet um, that are perceptive extensions. And one of the ways to think about the hands and the feet is how do you see when you turn the lights off? Your hands and your feet are so important. So again, these are very special receptors in the head. They're teleceptors, and really they can appreciate danger from a distance. What's happening in the surrounding environment? So the sight and the biocular vision or the depth perception, the hearing and the balance and the smell and the taste. And we've all seen these graphs before, if you've done level three, and it tells the different problems that, um, that you, might you might have if you have a problem in the receptor sequence. And I think that these are um, an area that we can sometimes forget to ask. So you need to say, you need to ask very specifically about these problems and um, trying to get some answers. So uh, do you have a problem with bright lights? Do you have tearing? Do you have dry eyes? Do you have any vision issues? Do you have any ringing in your ears? Do you have any buzzing? Do you have any vertigo? Cracked mouth, cracked lips, taste, smell, stuffy nose, runny nose. Does your nose run when you exercise? Uh, sinusitis. So things that people would never put together as to why they're here and they have a sore foot that won't get better. Why the heck are you asking me whether I have a runny nose? Sometimes you have to um, uh, go in with your story about everything is connected at that point. So how do we do this? Uh, again, you, it's the same way that we approach anything in FMID. You, um, your first palpation, you're looking for comparative uh, palpation in the head and the neck of the three planes, lateral, lateral, AP, or oblique, and then you test the points of the neck, and, um, and then you palpate the distal tensors. And then you look at each apparatus after you decide what's involved to see where they may have their own issues. And this is where things are a little bit different and we'll go over the, the, the points because they've changed a little bit. 
but the tension that you hold in the uh, in the vision around the eyes and the ears, it's not affected dramatically by the tension in the face. So sometimes it could be a totally different plane, and it's so you you don't want to get confused if you have. Uh, find an oblique point in the eye, but you don't find one every, anywhere else, and you're confident that it's um, the lateral lateral chain, but you find an oblique point, well, th that's totally fine because the, um, the tension in the apparatuses of the face can be different because they sit in these bony cavities that um, aren't pulled on. They're not affected as dramatically uh, on the outside by the fascia pull. They are just affected locally. So just reviewing these points again, um, for you that uh, people that have done FMID, the eye points are very similar. We're just uh, looking at um, anti caput one, lateral caput one, uh, IR caput one, ER caput one, um, and so on. And they are connected to the eye, the muscles around the eye and into the, the, the capsule. And they can affect the, the lacrimal grant gland and the duct and the orbicularis muscle and the, the one that lifts the eye. So, you know, sometimes you can see it right off um, that there's an issue with the eye because there's tears sitting in the corner or their eyelid is somewhat saggy on one side compared to the, to the other side. And then the ear ones, this is, this is where some of the changes have occurred. Um, before we used to say that you actually, you palpated points on the ear itself, but now it we're, um, what we think works best is, is just to palpate some of the known points um, that affect around the ear. So that would be um, internal, external rotation of CP2, retrolateral CP2, antilateral CP2, uh, ERCP3, and IRCP3. So those, um, you go in with the tip of your thumb or the index uh, finger, and often you'll find sort of lumps or bumps or nodules. Sometimes you'll see a skin discoloration. And then the next one is the chemo uh, apparatus. And you know, you, often smell and taste are very related. So often you think of the chemo apparatus as one, uh, you palpate all of it and you might find some of these points, um, even though they only talk about that they've got cracked lips, there might be something that's more involved in the nose as well. Uh, and basically, um, the points are as listed there. They're different. Uh, when you treat um, around the root of the teeth, when you go in, you know, basically, I often look for any kind of um, area on the root of the teeth uh, between the maxilla or the mandible that's tender. And you can treat that with your, your finger or your knuckle. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, people often have tender teeth. They don't think about it. They've been to the dentist, uh, but they just got too sensitivity and you can change that dramatically. <clears throat> Might knock some of the dentists out of business. They may not like that, but the patients sure do. So the next part is the distal tensors um, that you want to... Um, examine to see uh, what they're like. And they're the second palpation after the catenary, looking at where they are. You start with the ankles and the wrists, and then you may go on further uh, to look at the, uh, to the digits as well. Some people have that involved. Uh, you know, I had an interesting case thinking of the hands and the feet as a demonstration. This person came in with um, an issue with her foot or her ankle. And she said that every time she walked on rocks uh, where she would have to use her feet and sensation a lot more, she got dizzy. So that would be an example of how these are connected. 
So again, you have seen a lot of these points before, um, and sometimes you have to go distal to look at that. And also you have to look around the toes and the fingers, looking at the PIPs and the DIPs and palpating around those and even around the fingers. And people will often tell you, oh, my toe gets sore. And uh, yeah, you do that. So this is another part that I that interests me a lot when I treat the receptor sequence. So it's understanding this continuation of fascia um, on how you can how the hands and the feet are related. So we might to the head or the neck. So we can say it's mechanically related, and it is. So you can go for retrolateral carpi. You know, it starts at the gallia capitis, then trapezius, to the retrolateral deltoid, to the intramuscular septum of the arm, and down to the extensor carpi radialis. So that one we can all understand. But there is also an electric um, or a bioelectrical current that goes through. And I think it's an area of of research that's been out there, but it was first um, discovered by a French scientist in uh, late 1800s, and then by um, a couple of Japanese um, scientists in 1957 uh, found that there was a charge in the bone. But it basically, you know, fascia has an electric potential an inner ability to generate an independent electricity in response to a mechanical deformation. You know, essentially the collagen fibers are charged. And um, when a shearing force is applied, which is the deformation, uh, they slip past each other and this uh, piezoelectric charge is generated. And sometimes if the charge is too strong, it can, you know, affect the autonomic neural network and tension, um, attentional compensation can't extend past the hands and the feet. So you might get some densifications along the way in the apparatuses. So you also might get densifications on the way from in the, on the way to the hands and the feet. Um, as well, if we think of those pathways that go down from caput down to carpi and talus. So keeping this in mind, some of the piezoelectric um, effect, you know, sometimes that might uh, explain why we get some of the symptoms when we treat uh, the receptor sequence. So my experience uh, tells me that there is often a very strong electrical numbing feeling that the patients will get in their hands and feet. Different than when I ask for radiation where I'm treating just the musculoskeletal system or somewhere else, they'll say that, yes, it radiates to this. This is a very different uh, symptom that they'll say there's a buzzing. There's a buzzing in my hands and my feet. And often it's both. It's not one. The other things I'll notice when I treat um, this area is that they'll often start to move their hands and their feet. Sometimes they won't tell you what's going on, but watch their hands and their feet. They'll sort of move them. You ask them why and they don't know. Uh, they'll get, there's a lot of swallowing. They'll, you're finishing a point, <clears throat> you'll hear them, and the saliva is is likely um, is likely moving. So you'll hear that. They'll get vertigo when treating as well, um, and sometimes I'm I I'm I tell them, you know, when they're when they're struggling, you may be getting vertigo, you may be getting nauseous. Just hang in there; it's likely going to pass. I treated someone the other day, and I was treating their eye and they were getting vertigo and, you know, which probably demonstrates there's an eye ear connection. Tinnitus, you can increase their tinnitus as you're treating them. And whoops. Um, the other thing you'll hear is that <clears throat> uh, you'll often do that and stuffiness. Stuffiness is very common. So, 
what I would say is listen, 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 because I think that receptor sequence is missed a lot of the time. So you can pick this up when the patient walks in, you'll often hear this, this sniffling or clearing their throat and you're treating them somewhat differently and you hear the nasalness and, and they're, they're sniffling um, when you turn them over or when you treat a point. For me, that's an indicator that there's something up higher. Uh, there's something more to the story that you need to ask. It's often a piece that uh, just puts it all together and you can't figure it out. So I am always listening, always watching for any features that uh, might demonstrate that. So the last bit of the talk is concussion. That's a passion of mine. It's very big in the US or in Canada and in the US. I think our sports are uh, a little bit different than some of the sports that you have in Europe um, if you don't pay hockey. So hockey is a, a big area of concussion because you can hit the boards um, and concussion happens. So we all know, I don't need to go too much over the definition and there's a lot just to say that it's complicated. Um, it's an area of science that in research that's very new and um, there's a lot of things involved with it. So it affects the autonomic system um, and things have to happen. My interest is not in uh, acute concussion, it's in post-concussion syndrome. So um, it's a concussions that don't get better within a three month period. And 15% of concussions go on to post-concussion syndrome. There's risk factors listed, age, female, post -con post or past concussions, uh, mental health. One of the areas I can't see listed is what other traumas are involved. Because my experience is when people come in and they've got an old Achilles tendon tear or an old wrist problem, that uh, that is that could be very linked if we look at the receptor sequence in, in what we would treat on as to who goes on to post-concussion syndrome. And treatment management on the side is everybody, psychiatry, uh, physios, neuro, you know, a lot of people are involved because this really changes people's lives when they don't get better. So I think that um, uh, we have a role to play in this. These are symptoms of it. If some of you are not as familiar um, with this, if um, and it's headaches, dizziness, noise sensitivity. They can't stand loud noise. They can't stand it if a lot of people are talking. Bright lights bother it. Yes, they can't focus. They've often got tinnitus, um, rarely decrease in smell, and um, they're tired, they're irritable. I'd be irritable if I couldn't stand loud noises, if loud noises were bothering me all the time in bright lights. People falling asleep, uh, problems falling asleep, and of course, a headache. And um, they're really uncomfortable, and they often they can't do a lot. They can't go to school. They can't do a lot. So, where I think this is where I think that we make a difference. Look at the list on the right, and look at the list on the left. The headaches, often a tensile structure. Dizziness is AMR, noise sensitivity, AMR, light sensitivity, APR, um, ring in the ears, AMR. And so um, I, I, you know, my evidence so far is anecdotal as far as making a difference, but I know in a lot of these people, it gets them back functioning. And if anything, I think that it puts things in the correct position, the apparatus is in the correct position. So perhaps any changes that are actually traumas in the brain, maybe it has to work less. It's easier for you to heal. You know, there's so much research we don't know that's involved in all of it. Um, it but I think that we can help. So I know I'm running uh, short of time, but let me just review a couple of cases. Uh, one's a typical hockey player. Um, and it comes in with the neck stiffness, the vertigo, the, the hyperacuity, and school's difficult. He's had past concussions. So if you look at it, he's got problems with APR, AMR, um, 
problems um, with his headache, bilateral headache. So he would be a case that I would, uh, that one's easy to go to the receptor sequence. Um, and we look at the, just as you would do with anything else, you look at movement patterns, then you look at palpitation, and then you would, then you would go ahead and treat. So you would treat the, um, the caput, and then I would treat the distal tensors, and then I go into the receptors. Uh, after everything else is done, or sometimes they need another session in order to cover the receptors. Uh, so in this particular case, he comes back saying headache is better. I hadn't finished the apparatus, went in and did that, and he was much better. So my last case is a kind of a fun one that I really liked. And I think this is more real as to what a lot of us might get caught in. Retired opera singer comes in with hip pain for two years. He's obese. He has uh, trying to walk a lot. So you think that's why his hip pain is um, started. He had an old history of a foot injury, maybe trauma, maybe not. A motor vehicle and some mild um, signs FMID. So you try and decide how are you going to go in and treat this case. Well, my original hypothesis is that I'm going to go and treat the hip because I think it's probably related to that old foot injury he has. Um, and lo and behold, uh, he's stuck in the horizontal plane and um, he seems a lot better. Uh, I treat his neck as well, which is in the horizontal plane, and everything seems to be a little bit better. But second visit, we carry on, and his range of motion is still better, but his IBS isn't really any better, um, and his neck is still a bit of an issue. So IBS, when I did the uh, sort of a further workup, I find that he's um, more uh, in the lower, he's more of an ADI, so more digestive, more lower, Again, goes with my theory, he's got a problem in the lower leg, um, which is then affecting his uh, abdominal um, cavity. So we, I go ahead and treat him uh, lower for his ADI. But, you know, something's not jiving here. He, it's it's um, hip pain is getting worse. Um, now he says he's got a bit of ten or numbness in his left hand. So thinking, 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 you know, what am I doing? What's off here? You know, as we all have to take pause when we can't get something, which I thought was going to be a slam dunk with a sore hip and a sore leg, and he was going to be done, but he's still coming back. So am I on the right line? Have I treated all the visceral catenary? Have I missed something in the history? So back to the question, got any more trauma? He says, yeah, I forgot to tell you, I broke my arm when I was 13, had to give up the violin, can't hold it still, took up opera singer because he was a big singer, but then he lost his voice range. So learning case for me, you know, more history, voice change, numbness in his hand, decreased range of motion. Then he complains he's got dry eyes, occasional tinnitus. So now I'm into receptor sequence. And he was so uh, cool to treat because I started to think receptor sequence, his voice is affected. So instead of movement, you know, you know, is your neck feeling better? I said, sing. And he just kept singing. And it was so fabulous when, when I would release one densification and I got farther up, he just, his octave just kept going. I don't know who was more excited, him or me with, uh, with the whole thing. So what did I, in, in retrospect, when I look at this is, um, was that original ankle injury actually a receptor sequence problem as a result of his fractured arm? Then he goes on to walking, then he hurts his hip. So which way did it happen? Sometimes you don't know but receptor sequence might have told us a lot if I had gone with that at the from the get-go. And um, 
when I treated this guy, he kept clearing his throat until I was finished. So all I can say is receptor sequence is a really cool and uh, way to treat. And there's such great uh, response from patients. And um, you feel really good about it. Huh. Okay, um, Anna, that was great. <laughs> I can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, now we've got a lot of questions. What I and and not that much time. So um, what I thought I'd do is just pick out some that maybe are more related to what you've been talking about. So this one, for example. Okay, which was quite interesting. Okay, so if existing fascial imbalance can cause a later post-concussion syndrome, what do you think about athletes or people even without symptoms to be treated with FM? I, th I think it's the preventative. Prophylactically. Yeah. Prophylactically. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, there is something with that. But some, you know, I think our problem would be, where do you start? You know, I, I guess, um, you know, do we, where we start with the distal tensors and go with that? Um, where we start with head and neck? How do you, you know, how do we do testing to know range of motion? Do I think it would be helpful? Certainly for, you know, if you have some really glaring deficits, uh, such as, you know, something, a neck that doesn't move well at all, or an ankle that really hasn't healed well, I think absolutely it might help um, the onset of post-concussion syndrome. Yeah, it's always a question of if somebody's working with a team and they know that somebody has had something and they're not, then they're the people that need to be looking out for these sorts of ongoing problems, don't they? And maybe getting... I think so. And especially if, if, especially if hands and feet are involved. Um, I think there may be something to that. Right. Here's another question that's related to you know, this area of the head. If the sinusitis is frontal, do you expect points to be there, particularly in the frontal region? Um, not necessarily, you know, because it could be more posterior, it could be retrolateral or somewhere in the back that's actually pulling up on the front. Um, so it's just all about balancing the sinuses. So, um, but I, I don't think we can say specifically, you know, which sinuses are involved because if the balance is off, then um, it could occur anywhere. Okay, so... Um... This is another question that I can show you. Do you experience relationship between duper trends and receptor problems? Have you had any um, experience with that? That's a, that's a good point. You know, we certainly know fascia manipulation has um, an effect on, on, um, on the hands um, and it's often can be treated with fascia manipulation. So, um, I haven't had that many Dubatrons, but uh, in the last six months, I have had a couple, and those people did have issues with dizziness and um, dry eyes. So, you know, I would think very likely. Okay, so this is when it's a more general pressure, uh, question about level three. Can level three help patients with digestive problems, for example? even if they don't have back or limb pain? Absolutely, because there could be some silent points in there that they don't know about um, for sure. So usually there's something in the deep tissue of the arms and the limbs in digestive problems, um, but uh, and there's probably some kind of uh, something that's out of balance. So they may not complain of those points, but that doesn't mean they're not there. Okay, so this is a very actual one. It's, what is your approach to long COVID symptoms such mm -hmm. as loss of taste and smell? Yeah, well, so, so you know, 
there's a link there. I haven't treated anybody with that. So the question is, is loss of taste and smell a more peripheral? Is it a more central thing or is it a peripheral thing? So if it's, you know, more central, we don't really have an effect on it. I haven't seen anybody. My own anecdotal uh, evidence is when I had COVID and I had taste, uh, loss, of, loss of smell, I tried to treat my own symptoms and it didn't make any difference. So... Okay, this is another one still about level three. Have you had good success in treating pelvic organ prolapse? Um, uh, I've had um, some success in treating that. Certainly the incontinence that comes with that, we can make some kind of um, outcome on. So you, you, can change, you can't change it if it's, it's, if it's majorly prolapsed. It's difficult, but... Um, um, you, you can certainly have some effect on it. Okay, and Wayne has a question about, uh, I'll publish it now. Have you had experience with marrow transplant neuropathy or something like that? Uh, not, oh, so just general neuropathy, you know, mm. yeah, I, I, I I think that it, it is, you, you don't necessarily change that dramatically, but, you know, flip that a little bit. I often have people with receptor sequence that tell me they have numb feet and um, you, you can change that if it's, you know, again, if something, if the nerves are destroyed in the, in the nerve conduction tests say there's, there's nothing there, um, I think you're less likely to have an impact. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another rather long question, but I'll try and publish it for you and see what you think. When is the phenomenon called, what is the phenomenon called when patient suddenly becomes totally offline, eyes flapping, um, I guess looking quite disturbed. This took a while, but the sign's still partly visible after an hour. The next day was all good. What can I learn more of the mechanisms behind this type of reaction where the patient looked almost drugged after after they were working, I gather, on the breast muscle? Yeah, so, you know, I've had that situation before and I've actually had not the eyes flapping, but um, the legs flapping, the arms flapping, sort of a generalized uh, movement disorder and you sort of stop and, and quiet them down and... Um, they stop and you know i think that uh this this piece about the piezoelectricity that goes through it's there may be a lot of that that's that's taking effect there that there's a current um that's moving through when you see that kind of flapping um area um as far as looking dr drugged you know it's there's many patients that get a huge global effect when you treat them. They get hot, they get cold, they, you know, before a point release, they feel really unusual. Um, and so I think that comes from the drug piece, but um, usually it settles down. But there certainly is connections everywhere um, from all of this. And um, I think that, you know, you, you just need to tell the patient it's okay and, and, and uh, check back, but it may be that you also had to release something else for that um, to balance off some of that pull that was there. Mm. Okay, so we have one more question, which is kind of a general question for you. Maybe that was fabulous. So, and I <laughs> agree, and uh, I would love to uh, hear you continue this direction. So would I, and uh, this is not my question, it's from Andrew Eisen and maybe a series for lectures. So there you okay, go. Well, something for you to think about. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> okay, so I need uh, to let you go and um, enjoy your evening. All right, and thanks, everybody. Uh, I need to remind everybody else that um, there is going to be another um, webinar on the 5th of April. And it's um, in, held by L uh, Lorenzo Freschi. And it's 
the title is the importance of superficial fascia treatment in chronic and complex dysfunction. So I hope that a lot of you will be able to sign in for that too. Okay. And um, yeah, there were more questions coming up, but I think we have to let Anna go. So thank you everybody and have a good evening.